Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 162. Today, we're going to go over 25 different drills that you can use to improve or teach your forms. Now, whether you call them forms, kata, pumse, toll, patterns, routines, sequences, this stuff's going to work for all of it, regardless of your style. And if you don't have them in your school, this stuff, a lot of it is even going to work well to improve any kind of combinations you do. Anything from, you know, four or five movement sequence all the way up to some of that crazy 50, 60, 80 movement patterns that I see in some schools. First, who am I? My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel, and I'm also your host on this show, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. If you're new to the show, I want to thank you for taking the time to check us out. If you want to check out what we offer for products, whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to find our sparring gear and the rest of the great stuff that we have to offer. If you're looking for the show notes, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, why not? Do it, please. (laughs) If you haven't left us a review over on iTunes, I'm going to ask you to do that. If you haven't told a friend about the show, maybe you could do that. You know, there's a lot of ways you can help us out. I run through those pretty often. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to jump in. I'm going to talk about this list that I just came up with. And here's the funny part. I came up with this list so quickly that I'm guessing I'm leaving off at least as many as I've written down. I'm not going to call this the top 25 drills for improving your forms. And yes, I'm going to bounce back and forth between using the different terminology because I've trained in a number of different styles, and that's just kind of what works in my head. All right, first, real quick, why is it important to break down a form, a kata, into its different movements or to do it differently? Why is that going to help you? Well, a form is complicated by nature. Even if you're a brand new white belt and you're starting off with Teki Shodan or Taikyoko Shodan or Pinyon Shodan or Chongji or, oh gosh, I've learned a few more as, as early, an early martial artist. But anyway, I'm not going to run down through a list of all the first forms I've learned in different schools. That form is complicated for you, right? That's the whole idea. In most schools, as you progress, those forms are complex to meet your rank. It's something that you can use to develop. So by approaching it in different ways, you're going to develop not just the way that you perform that pattern, but you're going to develop the way that you approach all of your martial arts, because that's really the idea behind these sequences. There you go. Hopefully you get the idea of why. So now let's get into the what. These are not in a particular order, although I left some of the ones that I find the most fun for the end. First one eyes closed. You might be surprised if you've never done one of your forms with your eyes closed, how hard it can be. You can be in the same room that you always train in. You can face the same direction. And just by closing your eyes, you can really screw some stuff up. Don't believe me? Video yourself. You might be surprised. The next way, facing different directions. When I'm training newer students and they're starting to get bored, doing the same form or even part of a form over and over again, I'll have them face a different part of the room. It really messes with them. It gets them engaged. And if you've ever gone to a competition, a tournament, and you've tried to do your form and not had your reference points, oh, well, I know when I do this move, I'm facing this window, and this is towards the chairs, and this one is towards the clock. Well, what if you don't have the window, chairs, and clock? If you're always practicing your form facing the same direction, switching that up can be great. And if you really want to stump yourself or someone else, instead of having them face a a flat wall, start facing a corner. Oh, that messes people up like you wouldn't believe. So much fun to watch. Next, doing your form backwards. I don't mean facing the back of the room. I mean starting with the last movement and working up to the first movement. It's really hard. If you've never practiced it, it really shows your mastery of a form to be able to move backwards. If you've ever tried to say the alphabet backwards, I mean, how many times have you repeated the alphabet as, you know, a kid? And just to try and go, Z, um, 
Y, um, X, right? Like th there's a struggle there for something you've done probably thousands of times. To do the same thing with your forms can be just as difficult, just as rewarding. Now a twist on backwards is mirrored. Instead of starting with, say, your left hand, start with your right hand. Try to do everything the exact opposite the way you would see it in a mirror. Fifth method, if you want to complicate that even more, do it mirrored and backwards. I would suggest mastering or at least being able to get through both the mirrored version and the backwards version before you move on to that. Number six, and this is one that I just saw for the first time this past weekend at a Taekwondo testing, and I thought it was a lot of fun. You take a partner or small group of people. In fact, it doesn't have to be a small group. You get everybody lined up. The first person does just the first move of the, of the form. Second person does the second movement. Now, this isn't going to work for all forms. If you've got some that, that are done in place, um, in some schools, those are called Kibon or Kihon. That might be the way to do it. Again, this stuff isn't going to work for everything, but I like that one. And I thought it was a lot of fun. And of course, if you have more movements left, you get to the end of the group doing it. First person picks up where the last person left off. Number seven, just do your hands. Go through the moves. No feet whatsoever. Vice versa. You can do a form with just feet. Tuck your hands in your belt or just hold them behind you, maybe down at your sides. Guards up, you know, whatever works. Almost as hard, maybe even harder. Just do the stances. No hands, no feet. If you're looking for a way to get people to really dial in the way stances should be in a form, strip out all the complication of hand techniques and foot techniques and just make them do the stances. That can be really, really valuable. Number 10, do it as slow as possible. Challenge someone to take three to five minutes to do a form, but they've got to keep moving, right? It's not that you pause for an extraordinary amount of time in between movements, but you're doing the movements that slowly. It's going to build a lot of control, a lot of those smaller muscles that martial arts is great at developing. This is one of those ways. Now, number 11 is one that I don't have people do very often as fast as possible. Why don't I have people do that? Because they really tend to screw it up especially kids. Do this as quickly as possible. Well, the form goes to heck, right? We've seen that. Pe people do that even without asking them to do it as quickly as possible. But for more advanced ranks, trying to strip out power, trying to strip out deep stances, and just try getting your body to move as quickly as possible. And we're going to do a speed episode. I think it was last Thursday. I asked, do people want a speed episode? I got a resounding yes. That is coming. It will happen. And this is kind of a glimpse into some of the stuff that we'll talk about on that episode. Doing a form without any extra stuff, the bare bones, but doing it as quickly as possible. Similarly, as powerfully as possible. I'm not saying as strong as possible because that's a whole different thing. Power is strength and speed. So how powerful can you do those movements? That form's probably going to be fairly slow, but the individual movements will be very powerful. Number 13, how relaxed can you be when you do a form? A lot of people are familiar with San Chin, and we'll talk about that later on if you're not, that's okay. But the idea of doing your form with as little energy as possible, just totally chill out decent stances, you know, not, I'm not saying walk through it, but only use the muscles that you need to. Kind of an adaptation, you could do that, but initiate tension, rigidity at the end of the movement, kind of lock it in, which is great training for a focus. Number 14, do it the, with the best stances possible. Now you could do this as an adaptation on number nine, doing forms with just stances, but I'm talking about the deepest, longest, most ridiculously good stances you can. It's good conditioning, but also for people that struggle to get stances deeper, longer, or wider. For a lot of people, 
that's going to be a a compromise on whatever you're asking them to do. They're going to do less. If you want them to do a really long, wide, deep stance, they're not going to do it. They're going to do less, but maybe the less is what you really are looking for. Hope that makes sense. Number 15, exaggerated motion. How big can you make those moves? Let's say with a block, how enormously sweeping of a motion could that block be? If it's a kind of a scooping circular motion block, instead of it covering maybe just part of your torso, can it start at your knees and go all the way up and end above your head? There's a little bit of a dramatic flair, kind of goofy, cartoony martial arts element to that. And it can be a lot of fun, but it can also help dial in the purpose of these movements for people that don't quite get it. Some of the kids that can't visualize what some of these moves are doing, especially the blocks that travel horizontally across the torso, this can really help them understand, oh, that's what I'm doing with this. It's a little bit easier to get them to shrink up a movement over time than continually trying to get them to understand what something does. Number 16, the other half of 13, the relaxation is tension, sanchin. And I know that other styles have other names for it, but this is what I was initially exposed to it as. The idea that you perform a, a form, we'll call it a kata since I'm used to using it in that context. There is the sanchin kata, but you can also do other katas with sanchin. The idea that from start to finish, the movement is done with as much tension as possible. We talked about this a little bit on the resistance training episode. How hard can I work against myself to force that movement through? If you do any form, I don't care what it is, it can be the most basic form you know. If you do it properly with Sun Chin, you're going to be exhausted when you're done. Because it's not just the arm that's moving or the leg that's moving. It's your entire body. Everything should be rock solid. One of the traditional ways to check for proper Sun Chin execution is smacking somebody with a stick or a shinai, you know, bamboo sword, and checking, hey, are you doing this right? Are you tight here, here, and here? Oh, here's a spot. Maybe you're not. And you learn a lot about your body that way. Now, if you're doing that with a more advanced form, man, that can be brutal, especially the longer movements. It's going to take a long time to do. You're going to burn a lot of calories. You're going to sweat probably a lot while you're doing it, but it's a great way to build some strength within that form. Number 17, do it in a confined space. I was raised with the idea that you could do any form in a four foot square. Well, you can probably get even smaller than that. Putting down tape or locking yourself in a small room or heck, try to do it in a car. There are a lot of ways that you can adapt to your surroundings in practicing your forms. Another adaptation, uneven ground. If you have access to a steep hill, try doing your form. Try doing it all four directions. Well, make eight directions, however you want to look at it. Doing your forms on flat ground can be hard enough. Doing it on a really steep hill, going uphill or downhill or across the hill, that's really tough. And it helps you understand a lot more about the balance and the stances that are involved in your form. Doing your forms in water, number 19. If you've been lucky enough to train in a pool or lake or rivers, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. But one of the things that always struck me about it was that if I didn't have really good stances, if I wasn't, you know, working my feet kind of into the sand or, you know, grabbing onto the bottom of the pool, I didn't have as much to push back on to execute my techniques. Now, if you're just kind of going through it, it's not as noticeable. But if you're trying to execute movements with speed and power, a well, part of your body is underwater. And the more underwater you are, the harder it is, the more your relationship to the ground becomes apparent. This next one, you got to be careful. Number 20, 
holding your breath. I am not suggesting that you go to a group of, well, let's see, generally red and brown belts are the ones that are the most aggressive with this sort of stuff. And just tell them, I want you to do your most advanced form holding your breath the entire time. Because you might have some of them pass out and they might get hurt. So don't do that. And if you did that, I didn't tell you to do it. And it's not my fault. What I am suggesting. The concept of holding your breath really reinforces the idea of relaxation. You have to keep your heart rate down. You have to keep your movements slow but intentional. And you have to move at a reasonable pace because you've got a limited amount of time. The question may not be, can you do a form holding your breath the whole time? But how much of your form can you do holding your breath? It's something that people can gauge themselves. It's something that they can try on their own. You may not even want to suggest this to anybody. Maybe you want to try it yourself. Maybe you don't. That's fine. And that goes for all of these. Depending on your views on martial arts, martial arts training, and martial arts instruction, some of these may have no merit to you whatsoever, and that's okay. I'm sharing. I'm sharing ideas. Honestly, there are things on this list that popped in my head as I was writing it. Things I haven't even tried yet, but I want to. Number 21, something that does happen in a lot of schools. In Japanese, it's called bunkai, practical application. The idea that other people are throwing techniques that you can defend against and counter against by performing the form. And I know this happens in, I don't know if I want to say most schools, but a lot of schools. And I think it's really good. It can help illustrate the why that some people in martial arts, some students really struggle with. If they don't see the why, things just aren't real to them. And it makes it a lot harder for them to remember. So even as a memory tool, bunkai, practicing with other people can help a lot. Number 22, picking a point to start and stop on the floor. Now, this isn't the case with every form and certainly not the case with every style. But in a lot of styles, a lot of the forms are supposed to have the same starting and stopping point. And it's something that's discussed, but it's not something that's practiced very often. Give it a try. We're getting towards the end. Number 23. This is something that I've worked with people when they're practicing for competition or in advanced testing and they're struggling with a form. What are the two places that most people do very well on their forms? It's the beginning and the end. And there's something psychological about that. People tend to remember the beginnings and ends of lists. People tend to like to go either first or last in some sort of competition. You know, we all have our preferences there. So by picking a few movements within a form, depending on the form and the person, you know, I've usually picked three or four and making them explicit, I call them key movements. It means that the point in time where they're going to wake up and pay attention isn't just the beginning and end. It happens more frequently throughout the form. And I've used this quite often with people that tend to wander. Um, You know, I'm not going to say exclusively the ADHD crowd, but I see a lot of success for people that have trouble focusing on a lot of things. So I tell, you know, you're not focused on every movement. And yeah, the goal is to get them to there, but sometimes they need a stepping stone. They learn the form, they're doing the form well, the beginning of the form is great, the last few movements of the form is, is great. So we pick a few towards the middle and we drill sets, you know, from the first movement to that point and then the next sequence, and then we string it together. So they've got these points in the middle. Sometimes they have key ups, key eyes, yells, whatever you call it in your school, but not always. And those movements are intended to be as good as possible. If this part isn't making sense, somebody shoot me a message. I'll I'll put a better explainer in the show notes, but I, I feel like this is coming across. All right. Number 24. And this is something that 
I don't have a ton of time training with, but I love it. And I think it's something that can work really well, especially for learning forms. And if you're a math nerd, you'll get the why. If you're not, that's okay. I call it Sigma practice. And here's how it goes. You do the first move. Then you stop. Then you do the first and the second move. Then you stop. First, second, third move. Then you stop. Yes, you're kind of front loading the first movement. You're you're spending more time on that. That's okay. I see this as more a teaching tool. And I would argue that if you implement this way, you can probably teach someone a form in a very short period of time. It's kind of similar to the way my original instructor taught forms. And I did her, I, I was able to learn them pretty quickly. In order for this to work, you're not spending a lot of time talking about it. You're not explaining the why. You're not explaining the how. You're just doing it. In fact, you might even want to do this without talking because you're not trying to correct anything. You're trying to put the pattern, the pattern of the form, right? The routine into their brain enough that you can start to correct them on it. One of the things, and I'll go off on a small tangent here for a second. One of the things that drives me nuts is when someone is correcting a form that somebody doesn't even know. Why? Because those corrections will not stick. If someone doesn't even know the form, if they don't even know why they did the movement they did, if they're not going to be able to remember in two days that this high block follows this punch, correcting the way they move from high block to punch is a waste of your time in theirs. Give them the form first, get them to be able to do it on their own. I don't care how terrible it is, and then start refining. That's the way we work with just about everything else. How do you learn language? By stringing together whatever words you can. Imagine a parent saying, mm, your first word was mama, not mother. Right? It just, it doesn't make sense. We learn by doing things rough on our own, and then we start to refine them over time. Forms training, forms education should be a similar. And number 25, the idea of doing sigma backwards. Do the last move. Do the last move, then the second to last move. This is a way you can balance out first to last. So there you go. 25 different ways that you can practice forms with a bonus of <laughs> one of my pet peeves. So what do you think? This actually went a little longer than I would expected. I didn't think I had that much to say on any of these. I'm a little surprised. Maybe I shouldn't now. I sh shouldn't be surprised at how much I can talk. I love to talk. I know that. It's part of why there's a podcast and I'm on it. <laughs> I thank you for listening this far. Thank you for supporting Whistlekick. If you want to head on over to the show notes, I'm going to drop this list in there. It's not a fancy list. I'm not going to spend the time writing out explanations for all these because that's what this is for. This was an easy way for me to riff on each one and just kind of help you go through. Most of them are pretty obvious. Yeah, looking at the list, everything really is obvious. So you should be good to go. If you have questions on any of them, go ahead and email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. If you want to follow us on social media, you can do that. We're at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. Remember those show notes are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And you can check out our products at whistlekick.com. That's it. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you again in a few days. Till next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.